Peace of Mind podcast merges business and psychology. These topics are designed to inspire solutions for entrepreneurs to provide insights that improve their overall mental health and business success. Welcome to the Peace of Mind podcast. We have a special guest today. His name is Dr. Columbus Batiste. He's a cardiologist and he's very knowledgeable. You're going to get some specific information in this episode about the connection between the heart and business and stress and how all of those things come together and converge to either create a healthy lifestyle or a lifestyle that needs to improve in terms of its healthiness. So welcome to the Peace of Mind podcast. Dr. Columbus Batiste, it's so good to have you here on the Peace of Mind podcast. Been reading so much about you and had an opportunity to go to some of your events. And uh, so first of all, thank you for taking the time to come and be with us today. Oh, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Absolutely. So I want to jump right into it. I want to talk. I want you to talk a little bit about you growing up. Who were you as a child? Who were you in high school? And tell us about your college experience leading up to what you do now. So do you want to hear, you know, there's an old saying that says, the older I get, the better I was. Do you want to hear, <laughs> that? You want to hear the real version? Huh? The real version. The, the real version is good for us. <laughs> but, but we know we're going to be having an audience eventually of a million people or so. So, hey, give us the best version you have. <laughs> well, you know, truth be told, I'm the youngest of, uh, of five kids. And so I'm, I was, uh, as I like to call the pleasant surprise, my... <laughs> Brother is 16 years older than I am. Oh wow! It's yeah, an older sister. So yes, I was indeed the pleasant surprise. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and uh, I grew up in Compton, California, which is in kind of the South Central area down in Los Angeles. And I grew up there. Mom and dad, um, strong Christian um, family, um, who push as many in this era education. They valued education. And so they sacrificed and scratched and clawed to kind of put us through private schools, um, having some concerns about the schools where we were obviously um, nearby the public school system where we were at. And so grew up, went to school, went to a a private school, graduated. My dad told me, you have three options. He said, what are you going to be when you grow up? I said, I don't know that. He said, well, you have three options. You're going to be a a doctor, a lawyer, or a business person. (laughs) <laughs> okay, uh, doctor. I was always kind of curious the little books that were there. And so in my mind, I always said I wanted to be a doctor. Now, granted, I only knew one doctor peripherally from church, but never had really spent any time or really knew what I was getting into. And so I was fortunate enough to, uh, after I left high school, I went back down south and went to a historically black college and university where I met my wife. Oh, it's treasures down there, <laughs> <laughs> married 22 years. And so uh, that I'm she's having to deal with me. So that, that's, that's, uh, she may need to come to you guys for some psychology. <laughs> <laughs> uh, met her down there and then came back out to California for medical school. And I've been here ever since throughout for training and, and subsequent fellowship and then setting up shop and practice. Wow. So which historically black college did you go to? So I went to a school called Oakwood College. Oh, yeah, we know that. University now, but it was college yeah. back then. It's in Huntsville, Alabama. And the interesting part about that is I had gotten accepted into UCLA, but I chose to go to this historically black college. So ironically, fast forward four years when I'm applying for medical school, about three and a half years, I interviewed at UCLA. And one of their first questions, which I didn't even say it, was, so why did you choose not to come here at UCLA? Wow. Man. And I'm not sure exactly how they do or what was uh, going on, uh, but interest, it was very interesting, very interesting. And so, but I, I cherished my, my time at the Historically Black College. It did a lot for me. It did yes. a lot for me um, laying a foundation and a solid laying upon or building upon the foundation my parents um, had already set and give me a greater awareness really of our community and of some of the, the value the wonderful aspects of our community, as well as some of the challenges in our community. So it was extremely important in shaping who I am today. Yes, definitely. Both of our sons are HBCU students as well. One went to Hampton University and the other one goes to Howard. So so we have the battle of who's the real HU in our house. So. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. So we know that you shared with us that you went to medical school and you're a cardiologist. So with a heart being such an essential organ, many people don't realize until it's too late 
just some of the ramifications of what happens when you do not take care of yourself. So can you share with us just a little bit about facets that actually impact our health that are related to the heart? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I, so first I have to say, I love the heart. I'm in love with the heart. I feel as if I need to be a protector of the heart. And so at any opportunity, I always want to share information about the value with it. And so what we know about heart disease in general, right? So we're beautifully and wonderfully made. But unfortunately, just it's not the, the, the time that we live on this earth before we develop heart disease. We know that as early as the age of 10, we begin to develop features of coronary plaque. We know that these things can progress throughout the years in the life. And we know there's so many different factors that play a role. So we know that there's issues in terms of there is a genetic component, but remarkably so. It's only a very small percentage that's actually related to your great grandparents or your grandparents or your mother or anything of that sort. It's very small. Oftentimes what we find is it's more nurture than it is nature. That means it's our environment. It's our social connections. It's our, what we call social determinants of health. It's our nutrition. It's our activity or inactivity there. So uh, it's our stress that plays a huge role in it. It's our absence of sleep that plays a big role in it. All these things kind of build up and it ends up being almost like a Teflon pan. You know, when you buy that Teflon pan, it's smooth and silky, yes. right? Nothing yes. sticks to it. Out, but after a while, <laughs> it starts to get worn down. Right, right. right. Everything right. sticks to it, right? The trials mm -hmm. of life begin to wear on it. And now we see the, that the end effects of it. And that's kind of what happens in the body as we start to see this wear and tear that in some is more rapid than it needs to be because of these risk factors of smoking, inactivity, um, our nutrition, our stressors, long hours at work, not laughing, things of these, this nature all play a role. Man, I've never heard the heart with an analogy with a pan. <laughs> you have a way of being able to help us to understand such a complicated organ to me <laughs> in such an easy way to, to understand. Yeah, you, you talked earlier about just those stressors. And one of the things that I look at is as a business owner, different people have this entrepreneurial journey. So they have financial stress. They have stress with family, just being gone, long hours and all of this. So could you talk to us a little bit about the impact of stress specifically on the heart? Oof, stress is so huge. I mean, if we just look at stress in general. So the thing I learned about stress, it takes me back to my first year out of uh, medical school. It's called an internship year in training. I never forget my first night on call. I had been up nearly about 36 hours. This is back when they, before they had restrictions on time for uh, docs and training. And I remember driving home and I'm chatting with my sister on the telephone. And she starts in like, did you take care of this for mom and dad? Did you do X, Y, and Z? And I remember I stopped, I said, do you realize what I was doing last time? Mm -hmm. I was just a little bit stressed. I, I, had to, I had this patient not doing well, that patient not doing well. I've been out 36 hours and she stopped and said, you're not the only one who's stressed. I have a baby, an infant here. And then if I don't do whatever I need to, then she's not gonna do well. And you're not the only one who's stressed. And it's, I paused. I didn't get mad and say that my stress is greater than your stress. Right. What I realized is that stress is solely, it's an internal response to an external stimuli. And we all respond differently. But what happens is that when you're faced with a stressor, all of a sudden the process begins in your body that unlocks this whole mechanistic effects, right? You store a memory in a portion of the brain called the amygdala that stores all your fears, all your basic primal responses that are there. And when you recognize one of these fears, these primal uh, events, all of a sudden now a cascade begins. It unlocks a hormonal cascade that your pupils will dilate. All of a sudden your mouth may get a little bit dry, the blood shunts from your skin, and so your hands may feel a little bit clammy as they get uh, diverted to the large muscle groups preparing you for what? To run or to fight in an yes. instant. Now all of a sudden now your blood vessels crimp down creating a hypertensive state. Now, all of a sudden now too as well, your blood sugar begins to mobilize within your body to feed and deliver to the muscles to give it the energy it needs to propel itself, creating what? A diabetic state. All of a sudden you become hyper acute, hyper aware that now you aren't gonna be able to fall asleep in an instance. Now this is good when the dog is chasing you. It's good right. when right. you're fleeing from someone, but in unrelenting stressors, unabated, 
It leads to disease states of diabetes, of high blood pressure. It leads to insomnia, right? As we have insomnia, lack of being able to sleep, it increases further our stress hormone levels. As we do this, all of a sudden now we're hungrier and we release a hormone called ghrelin. This hormone makes us hungry and our leptin, which gives us the satisfaction feeling, goes away, which means people get the munchies. All of a sudden, right. the later right. they stay up, the more they tend to snack, right? We see that. We know that. Yeah. I that from last night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that's what I see as one of the biggest problems. So then what do you do when you're tired? Now you drink caffeine. Now you turn to caffeine, right, to give you the awake feeling, which further restricts your ability to fall asleep. What do you do now as you're stressed? And so now we use, we turn to food. Right. Placate us to give us some sense of satisfaction, of enjoyment that's there. Some folks may turn to alcohol. Some folks may turn to various vices that give them a sense of pleasure to counteract the stressors that they're going through. And so all these things have a, a play on the heart, these unrelenting stressors of elevated blood pressure. The elevated blood pressure ends up being like bench pressing, lifting a weight. You can do it for a while. After a while, that elevated weight, you can't push it off of you. And that heart muscle that normally is squeezing against the pressure of elevated hypertension eventually will fail and no longer be able to do it. So that's right. one thing that can happen. The heart thickens in it and then it can fail. We know that the diabetes that's persistent elevated blood sugar can cause placking and disruption of the vessels of the, heart, of, of the body that can lead to them becoming corrosed, right? And they get this corrosion and they get this area where now there's narrowing that that goes. The combination of the high blood pressure, a combination of the of the uh, the blood sugar, along with the foods we're eating and the stress that results in cholesterol elevation, all these things become the perfect storm for cardiovascular events. And that's not even the most significant one. What's the most significant one? The most significant one is when a person has an, a very acute stressor. Now, here's the thing. It happens more in women than it does in men. And so when there's a broken, when a person gets in a relationship that ends, they're yelling at their boss. They're having these moments of stressors there. They're yelling at the kids. And all of a sudden, they have this gripping chest pain, this surge of hormonal release, and their hearts break. It's called a broken heart syndrome. Yes. Mm-hmm. Disorder. And so in an instant, you go from beating and contracting normally to, to ballooning out. So it's called takosubo or ballooning heart syndrome is what it's described as. So stress is powerful. Stress can work against us. It can work for us, give us just enough drive to go ahead and to get things done, give us enough energy to escape danger. But when it's chronic and persistent and unrelenting, that's when it's problematic. See, that's the crazy thing, because to me, it's such a silent killer because we don't necessarily connect the stressor or living a stressful life to ultimately leading to us dying. And, you know, heart attacks, the number one cause of death amongst people. And so, wow, that's that's so eye opening. Well, here's the here's the crazier part. Right. It doesn't even matter if the stress is real or not. So, you know, we've all gone to situations where we're worrying, we're worrying, we're worrying. And we, why was I worrying? There was nothing to worry about. Right. We perceive a stressor. Yeah. We perceive danger when whether there is one or there isn't. And just the perception of stress has been shown to be related to disease, to cancer, to diabetes, to elevated blood pressure, to strokes, too, as well. So we know that this stressor, and so this is something that is, is really troubling all Americans across the board is this heightened sense of stress that we're all under. So, so you mentioned just the perception of stress. Can Studies have shown that it can actually in, increase heart conditions, which is pretty much anxiety, because a lot of times when, when you perceive something, it increases your, your levels of anxiety. So in your experience as a cardiologist, I know that in uh, the field of functional um, medicine and a lot of the naturopathic doctors have been really talking about that there's a new thing called three brains, meaning your, your real brain, your gut, and your heart. And so what is the connection between depression and, and a lot of the mental health issues in terms of, you just mentioned anxiety, how is that connected to, to the heart? 
Yeah, you know, it's, it's very similar. I mean, the easy way I kind of describe it is that these are all forms of stress like you, you appropriately pointed out. So whether or not it's depression, whether or not it's stress, whether or not it's anxiety, whether or not it's any of these mental anguishes, these ailments that, that occur are really stress that's there. And so I always like to kind of describe stress relationship to our health is that our health equals our resiliency divided by our stress. The higher the unabated stressors in our life, on the, on the bottom side of that equation, that means that the worse our health is. The right. higher our stress, the poorer our health is what we find on a regular consistent basis. And so study after study has shown a distinct relationship between depression and recurrent heart attacks when you normalize for diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Studies have shown that a lack of support of social emotional support ends up resulting in increased uh, likelihood of recurrent cardiovascular events. This loneliness, this grief, and right now, no time more than ever in the past, people are really suffering because of the COVID crisis. Right. Right now, people are in isolation and they're feeling this sense of loneliness. They're feeling this sense of depression, this fear, this loss. They're grieving right now. Why are they grieving? Because of loss of normalcy. Some people are losing, are grieving over the loss of their job. They lose, they're grieving over the fact that, that just their routine, all these things. My own mom said to me, you know, she's, she'll be 85, bless her heart. And she looks wonderful. You know how, how, how some ethnicities do. They don't, they don't show any of their age at all, right? She was jump roping. I saw her on Instagram. Jump roping and everything. Yeah. So, so she said to me, because I told her, I said, mom, listen, you don't need to go out. You don't need to kind of do it. Whatever you need, we'll get in for you. You're good here. Siblings kind of stay away to my brothers and sisters. She lives with me. And at some point now, about six, eight weeks after we went into social distancing, right? Stay at home order. She says, well, when can I go out? You just be a text, right? She knows how to text. <laughs> I said, okay, question mark. What do you mean? Said, no, it's not time. We still need to kind of, you know, stay apart. And so she says, this is inhumane. I just love your mom. She has a point. <laughs> and you may. And so as I thought that, at first I was going to say, mom, just stop and, and sit down somewhere. Stop uh -huh. all, right? And I thought about it. When you look at even states that have gone into prisons, when they look at individuals, inmates put in solitary confinement, right? The fact that it heightens your sense of fear. It heightens the actions of that amygdala, amygdala I mentioned of that stress where you perceive it decreases your emotions, your ability to learn, your ability to kind of, to, to, to relate to folks. And so people have a heightened sense of fear as they're in this isolation, as they're listening to the news, as they're having the fear of the unknown that's happening. So your point's well taken in terms of the, the impact of stress and depression and anxiety on our hearts. It's astronomically high. And that relationship is also tied to our gut. It's also tied to our gut. And the reason why is because our gut is filled with bacteria. Now, before you get grossed out, right? <laughs> we more, have more DNA from our bacteria than we have from our own cells as human beings. Wow. That's that eye-opening. Yeah. So it's like, you know, I mean, my, my, my family, they love movies, right? So great movie uh, years ago, a couple of years ago called Venom. It's a superhero movie. Mm -hmm. And so there's this alien from outer space that comes in it. It's searching for the perfect host to live symbiotically with, which means that it's not going to cause, neither will cause harm to one another, right? Mm -hmm. And so in, in some hosts, it kills them immediately. And he finds finally the best host, and they're able to become superheroes, basically, in that moment. So we have these gut micro, microbes in our system, all of these bacteria that are there. And we have some that are good guys and some that are bad, bad guys. And they actually can, studies are showing increasingly, they determine our risk for uh, cancer and for diabetes. They determine our, outlook, our risk for depression and anxiety based on these gut microbiome. Now, here's the crazy part. The foods we eat can either grow the good bacteria or it can suppress the bad bacteria. The foods we eat, if they're bad for us, can grow the bad bacteria and suppress the good bacteria. Mm. There's so much power in our choices, but not only the food, our mindset, 
or activity are all things that can influence the gut microbiome. And so it is more and more evidence is telling us that everything we do, everything we think, every way in which we choose to be, to be that we're becoming plays a role in what, who we are right now in this moment. 100%. In terms of the choices that we make, it's so powerful. And there's a presentation that you do that's actually where we first met called Slave Food. And so one of the things that came out of that presentation was just the way that we eat and the mindset behind it. And so even earlier when you were just talking about the, the amygdala, we have our frontal lobe that actually takes precedent as well in terms of how do we plan, how do we organize. And so in terms of just the nutrition, um, tell us a little bit about slave food and, and what, what that entails. No, thank you for bringing that up. And it's, that's, that's a project of passion of mine. And so for many reasons, and one of the reasons is that it's clear through just the practice of medicine and obs observation of people around me, family, friends, community, is that African-Americans inside the United States die sicker and sooner than everyone else, point blank. We're seeing this play out now in the COVID crisis. We're seeing that there's a high proportion of African-Americans who are succumbing to the illness of COVID, of SARS-CoV virus, right? And we're seeing it. And why is that? Because we also concurrently have the highest rates of obesity. We have the highest rates of diabetes, highest rates of hypertension globally within, uh, within America. Uh, we have the highest rates of heart disease and more likely to die of these things, more likely to have complications. At every stage of life, we die sicker and sooner than other ethnic groups. Right. And so my partner and I, as we began to kind of look at these experiences that we were observing in, in friends and family and, and communities, we started to kind of really tease into the question of why this is. And so, you know, as we were talking about so appropriately, so in terms of stress that impacts all of us, whether you're Asian or Caucasian, whether or not you're Latino or you're African American, we all are succumb to stressors of life, financial, relationship, political, all these various things. But there is a unique stressor that African Americans face. And that's that of racial discrimination is what we see on a regular basis. And that we can't hide from our skin color at all. It doesn't matter your level. And so what we, we found is that this racial discrimination whether it's, it's real or it's perceived, also pretends another layer of risk for, for events. It also is related to high blood pressure. It's also related to stroke and to cancers and to heart disease is what we're clear, clearly seeing. And so as we see that this, this, this combination of these stressors that are there, that are happening and this nutritional stress that's then bolstered on top of it, we're seeing that we are in fact enslaved to our food because as a vestige of the stress, many of us turn to our foods. Right. As a vestige of our communities that have been shaped throughout the eons of time for reasons it'll be too long for me to go into here. You've heard many of those inside of the, uh, the presentation, right? Many of us urban communities like we live there are food deserts and food swamps that essentially amount to food apartheid is where we're living that now we have individuals where we say, well, make a choice, use your frontal lobe, use right. your free will and make a choice, but everywhere around me are only fast food places. Mm -hmm. Everywhere around me is an absence of fresh fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. Everywhere around me, the public transportation doesn't allow me to carry enough bags to carry these things. Right. Right, so now everywhere around me, there's government subsidized foods that drop the price of those that are processed and ultra refined. Whereas the price of the foods that are singular ingredients like broccoli, like kale, like rice, like beans, they, we, my perception is that it's more expensive. Heaven forbid it be organic. Absolutely. <laughs> and, so, and so now we say make a choice, but really we take the choice away for certain segments of the population. So by in part, they're enslaved to their environment, right? That we've all gone, and even those of us who are financially able and we don't live in those areas, I mean, how many times have you gone to a grocery store and you're starting out to buy the best thing ever? I never forget going to the grocery store. 
<laughs> I went to the grocery store. I had all these fruits and vegetables. This is about 15 years ago. So I'm, I, I've kind of, I've, I've been delivered from that moment there. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember going and I'm sitting in this long line and what do they put? On in the aisles, right there as you're yes, waiting. Yes, yes. <laughs> everything you all know the candy bars, so the licorice, <laughs> <laughs> the soda. <laughs> and so in that moment of weakness, as I'm sitting there stressed, knowing I need to be somewhere, I grab a few. I put it on the conveyor belt there, and I never forget the words of the checkout clerk. He said, "Man, I was going to say you're about the healthiest person I've ever seen in my life." <laughs> like me <laughs> yes wow. mm -hmm. until you're just like me as he scanned the candy bars and the soda that i had put on them i sheepishly went away and get rid of them right <laughs> that's the thing is that we're we now i had a choice but i was enslaved based upon what stressors mm -hmm. of life mm -hmm. Reese, what's around me in that moment. And so that's really the, the subject matter of slavery is looking at really the layers between our stress, racial discrimination. We're looking at our food and our choices and understanding that when we go ahead and there is a better way, that even within the confines of, of an inner city, you know, I grew up in Compton, as I mentioned, I never forget my dad driving. I, used to love, I still love going to the grocery stores. I do most of the shopping throughout the 22 years of marriage because I enjoyed it as a kid. It was my time to spend with my dad. And I remember riding in this car and we would drive about 22 miles, 25 miles out of the city Jeez. to go grocery shopping. Wow. Was, oh, I'm just having fun. Not realizing it's because I lived in a food desert. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to provide some avenue of more helpful resources for us. And so that's the key is the fact that we have to change. We need to bring awareness to this issue that's really facing urban America, yes. right? And at the center part of urban America, we have many communities of color that live in these urban communities. And those happen to be the same ones who have the tremendous health disparities. The, it's, slave food is not about a black issue. It's not about a brown issue. It's about an American issue is what it's about because if we don't take time to do something about this thing called health disparities, this healthcare crisis in America, right now we're missing out on about $93 billion. The studies have shown that, that if we were able to narrow health disparities, we could save $93 billion on unnecessary medical costs. $42 billion can be gleaned back and lost productivity from, from premature deaths, mm -hmm. from being out of work because of all these things. And instead of us having a dialysis center, a dialysis center on every corner next to the fast food places, why don't we transform our communities and transform our mindset and look at mind, body, and spirit? And so that's really what that project is, is about. And that's why it's important is to bring a visual to it, not just a verbal, but a visual to really the impact and knowing that Guess what? It's not all death and doorknobs. There are people who have lived this life, who've transformed and changed the game. They've decided to go ahead and, and get tap into their mind, right? And deal with the stressors of life and their depression by seeing a specialist, by seeing a spiritual counselor too as well. They've decided to go ahead and transform their nutrition step by step, moment by moment, thereby getting away from their medications. Not that medications are evil, but they should be a last resort, not a first resort. And that's really the key. You shouldn't come to me and have to see me on a regular basis. It should be something where it's a rarity because we're born, we die. We understand that. Right. Mm -hmm. It's how we live in the in-between that matters and why we're doing it. That's a perfect segue because there's competing philosophies. One is about intervention and the other one is about prevention. So which, which, which should we be more focused on? Talk to us a little bit about, about how those philosophies compete, what they are, and how we should focus. Yeah, I have a little saying that I've said in the past is that I said there is no prevention, there's only intervention. And the reason why is because we're all born in sin and inequities, right? Right. Disease begins, we're fighting disease every single day. So we know that even in this, this, this case of COVID right now, that there's 80% of individuals will not have any symptoms whatsoever. They have no idea they've been infected. 
but they're walking around with it. Their body is in this constant fight between wellness and illness mm -hmm. on a regular basis. And so the, the issue is, is we think the difference between you all, so Lord willing, you all don't have any heart disease, no issues, so let's go under that premise right now that we know of. Mm -hmm. The only difference between you and someone who's had a heart attack is that person who has a heart attack knows distinctly that they have the problem. You're walking around with a false sense of security. It's almost paramount to the person who's been struck, uh, given a notice that their, their car has been rejected because of insufficient funds, and the other person who's walking around and they, they missed the notice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> walking around, they don't have any money in the bank. <laughs> They've overdrawn on their credit card, but they don't know it yet. Mm -hmm. Because they haven't gone to make the next purchase. Yes. The only difference is so I see it as there is no prevention. There's only intervention that right now as my kids don't have any credit score, they don't have a job, they don't have regular income. Right now is not about preventing them from going into bankruptcy or financial um, L's. It's about intervention, intervening to show them how to be successful. And the same thing goes from a nutritional standpoint and from a wellness standpoint. At every phase, we start off our kids at age one with a smash cake. And every time that they do yep. something, oh, I'm going to buy you a donut. Let's stop mm -hmm. and get some ice cream. And now what we do is we connect them with this reward system. Mm -hmm. I deserve it because I worked hard. I deserve it because I'm stressed. I deserve it because I'm sad. Let me give me something that's going to be a false sense of replacement, right? Mm -hmm. So we develop, we ingrain in our kids this cue routine reward that what we do is that we say okay every time you have this cue that you're feeling sad our routine is going to be we're going to x y and z jump donut shop or or ice cream shop to make you feel better and the reward is really not about the ice cream or the donut but it's really about spending time with the parent mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. right that's really the reward and so what we do is we have to reshape our perspective our mindset and transform that in order to really impact our lives. And so that's why I make the statement that there is no real pre uh, prevention. There's only intervention at each stage that becomes vitally important. We have to understand that we are all at risk, including myself, for heart disease. We're all at risk for cancer. We're all at risk for diabetes. We're all at risk. It's all, it's there. Our body's fighting it. Who am I arming? The good guys or the bad guys? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's so good. Man, one of the things that we say in the business world is that we give up our health to attain our wealth, and then we give up our wealth to get back our health. Mm -hmm. So can you talk as we start to wrap up about some specific tips that business owners or business owners-to-be can take to really ensure that as they're on their journey, that they can maintain their health as they strive for their wealth? Absolutely. I think it's important for everyone in business, every professional person, Number one, everyone's busy and they have a schedule. They have, their right. they have their duties. I think what's important is to schedule time for you. Mm -hmm. Schedule time for you. That's not something that's negotiable. It's not something that you can kind of go into. You are the CEO of your body. You are the CEO in charge of the planning out the trajectory of this business called your life, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to invest in that equally on a regular basis, whether or not that's saying, okay, you know what, I'm going to commit that my alarm is going off, I am in bed. Why? At whatever time it is, if it's 10 o'clock, if it's 11 o'clock, if it's nine o'clock, whatever it may be, I may not have time to exercise, but guess what I can do? I can walk, I can take the stairs. Right. Mm -hmm. I can, I can, I've worked and achieved so much that I have my little parking placard right at the front. No, I'm gonna give it up to someone else. I'm gonna park in the back that's and good. walk, <laughs> right? So I'm going to take every single moment, I'm going to transform my office and have a standing desk. So in that way I'm standing more than sitting. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna get a BOSU ball or I'm gonna get one of the, the balls there and I'm gonna use that so it maintains my posture. I'm going to do simple things in order to increase my, my avenue. I'm going to break my exercise up into 10 minutes or 15 minutes and not try and think I need to, to, to do it for an hour and a half and lift weights like I did when I was 30 years ago. Right? I'm going to break it up and make it practical. What I'm going to do is I'm going to commit tangibly and say, okay, you know what? Every, this is what I will do for my health today, this week. I am going to go ahead and add in some berries. 
I don't like raspberries. I don't like strawberries. I don't like boysenberries, but I'm okay with blueberries. So blueberries it is. I will right. add half a cup and I'm going to be tangible and I'm going to be practical, right? I'm going to say, how am I going to get, I'm going to add my vegetables. Don't just say I'm going to add vegetables. You wouldn't say that for your business. Mm -hmm. You want to know how. You want to know what's your approach. Do the same for your whole entire life. That is your body, which is the company of your body. So what I advise folks to do is to take time for three components, your activity, your nutrition, and your sleep. Because we're the first ones. I suffered with that my own self early in my career. I would walk around procedure to procedure. I grab a protein bar, a, di a diet soda, a regular soda at that point in time. I wouldn't even take off the leaded suit I was wearing. Wow. Just I'm like, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I got so much to do. I'm so important. No. Guess what's going to happen when I die? Nothing. <laughs> the world will continue to move forward. The world will continue. continue. They will go ahead and bring someone else in to do the procedures to yes. see the patients because that's what life is. Yes. In order for me to be the best version of myself, I have to invest in myself. And so that's your greatest investment. And so that's really what I talk about. And everyone's slightly different. So it's hard to kind of give a general term to everyone. But I think you have to be committed. You have to have a tangible. And I recommend to everyone, get a calendar. On that calendar, whatever you commit to, you put an X on that calendar every day you achieve it. You commit to one thing. Start off this week. I'm going to drink 60 ounces of water. Okay. Your goal is not to miss more than one day. You want to keep a streak alive. That's your goal. And you want it visible where you can see it. And then you begin to add to it. So now all of a sudden you may have four X's inside there as you go. And that's your goal is to build up a repertoire of successes, these small steps, these small habits that lead you towards transformational outcomes. I love that because as business owners, we're very competitive. And so if we create something and make it a game or we make it something that's competitive, I like that because that's practical and it also aligns with our mindset. So that's very good. Very good. We thank you so much for your time. As a cardiologist, we know how busy you are, and you have definitely imparted us with some great tips for our listeners. So for our listeners, before I let you share how you can be found, I am so intrigued. I know you have kids. So what are the things, what are the appropriate treats? Like, I am both my husband is a sweet person. I'm a food person. Like I like to eat food. And so what what are some healthy types of of things when we do achieve like we talked about as business owners, we are very competitive. We once we achieve something, we do want to be able to reward ourselves. So if we decide to reward ourselves with food, what are some healthy options that taste good? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all about taste and all about food. So absolutely. And I think everyone has their thing. So I'm a recovering sugar holic. Just <laughs> that's my thing. So I, I tend to be real big on smoothies. And so now I, I may add more pineapple and mango to my frozen smoothies. And that will give me a, a sense of, of alleviating my taste, taste for like sweet at that time. I have this little recipe that I got from one of the uh, chefs out there. And it's a, a chocolate truffle. And it uses dates and it uses peanut butter, oil and sugar free. Um, use a little bit of vanilla extract, um, a little bit of cacao powder, blend it up in a food processor. You freeze it, scoop it out, and roll it in nuts, and it tastes like candy, and it tastes so decadent. And I'm eating. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, so I, I, I love things like that. I will go ahead, and I'll do some other, a little bit slightly more refined things in making like a, a plant-based version of, of cookies or whatever else for the kids and so forth. I think the main thing from a standpoint of family that becomes important, so I don't hesitate. I think it's important to be mindful. And as you go into things, you understand well, eyes wide open what you're doing, right? And so if I'm going to choose to have it, don't close your eyes and not look at the ingredients. <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> plan for it. Plan for it and say, okay, you know what? I know I'm going to have this moment. So I need to load up on everything else. Right. And I tell folks, this has come back to haunt me whenever I tell this story. But my mom, uh, every year growing up, would make me a German chocolate cake, myself and my brother, a German chocolate cake for our birthday. And um, so at one point when I started down this path about uh, 12 years ago now, 
I said, mom, I don't want any more cake. I remember she looked at me with these hurt eyes. Mm -hmm. like, okay, because that's the way she expressed her love. Right. Mm -hmm. Expressing her love by, she can't give me monetary things or things of that nature, but it, that's how she expressed her love. And I remember thinking after my dad passed, listen, one day my mom's not going to be here or I'm not going to be here, one of the two, and I'm going to wish I had that cake. Yes. So I said, instead of me doing that to her, why don't I go ahead and say yes and have just one slice without eating the whole entire cake like I used to <laughs> ice cream um, <laughs> or to bring the rest give it away and go from there now my crazy self what i ended up doing is i ended up going completely green i don't have anything else before and after that period to go and get myself in <laughs> you got to justify that german chocolate right <laughs> right so i i think you have to commit and understand what you're doing and why you're doing it and um and either allow yourself but we have to change our mindset from thinking that we're living to eat. And we I like to, that. You no, know, I, I, and we eat to live, not living to eat where every action is based on what are we going to do next? Where are we going to eat next? What are we going to have for a snack? Okay, when can we go get this? How about I'm just fueling my body? How about I'm, I'm doing it for energy that what is once again propelling me towards my goal? What's my goal? And keeping my eye on that prize. Thank you so much. You helped to relieve my anxiety before we got off of this podcast, and I'm pretty sure my husband's as well. Sure. So with us ending, um, we just, again, enjoyed this time with you. How can our listeners find you when I know that at the end of this podcast, they're going to want to be able to know more about you? Appreciate that. My wife will thank you or I thank you because she'll beat me up for never giving out the uh, social media handles. So <laughs> Instagram and Facebook, it's uh, healthy heart doc. And on Twitter, it's I am healthy heart. I am healthy heart. And lastly, I have a website, uh, the healthy heart doc.org. Um, it's a subsidiary of a website for my nonprofit healthy heart nation with the goal is to deliver information in communities at risk. Thank you so much. You have a very blessed rest of your day. We appreciate every moment that you spent with us. Thank you so much. I enjoyed you all. Absolutely.